uh, when I when I start this real quick, I want to just make a preface that uh, I had a little bit of struggle in getting the book down to compile. So John, um, there's one uh, file, HTML file in the repository currently that just is not playing nice and it may just be my computer as well. Um, but this I did by just rendering the single HTML file. Uh, even the knitter uh, icon wasn't working. Uh, I was getting a, uh, it didn't like my pipe uh, figure, but then there was probably another error after I corrected that too. So anyway, uh, I, I just went with the single file. Uh, when I submit this, um, I guess we can work together and figure out yeah. the difficulty. So um, yeah, I have a guess at what it is, um, but we'll, we'll sort it out. Okay. <laughs> no uh, so this is actually chapter 25 team. So the, <laughs> uh, the numbering sequence on top, just if you put 25 in front of it, uh, that's going to be accurate. So uh, this is going to be many models and it's not so much about the modeling feature, but there is a lot of examples about it. Uh, what we're going to be dealing with here is management of lists or actually nested lists, uh, last, uh, nested data frames. So the concept of this particular chapter is capping off on the previous 20 uh, uh, chapters 23 that Frederica gave and 24 that John gave last week. Uh, this last section is pulling all of that together, but then really showcasing how you can nest and unnest data frames uh, when we're dealing with long lists of detail. And nesting is really an awesome feature because it gives a whole host of extra things that you can do with it. At any rate, the learning objectives that John had wrote for this section were create nested data frames to organize uh, data by groups. We'll see this with our Gapminder package. Uh, create a list columns to generate new data in an organized structure. This is gonna be critical for the searching feature that we'll showcase. And then finally, simplify list columns to manipulate the data that, that they contain. Uh, at the very end of this section, we'll start talking about uh, evoking some map, uh, sorry, some per packaging uh, map features, uh, PMAP, map, map two, and then, uh, at the very end of this section, we'll talk about broom as being another uh, means in which you can start to uh, manipulate and visualize some of your media, textual form, not, not graphical form. All right. So the introduction, the main purpose of the section is to tidy your data. We've always had in our 4DS book throughout many of our chapters that we've covered is all about working with tidy data. Uh, tidy data has a very specific format and it is most or most um, reachable to make your job in the modeling feature simpler. Uh, the concept here is, is how to model summaries and can help us pick out outliers and an unusual trends in data. As your experience grows with the exploratory data analysis or EDA, you will find your models grow as well. Um, case in point would be as we go in and start looking at the tidy modelings with our or tidy tidy models uh, with our book. Uh, this really uh, showcases this chapter showcases why this particular concept is important. There was a note from the author, uh, Mr. Wickham says the chapter is somewhat aspirational. Uh, if the book, uh, if this book is your first introduction to R, the chapter is likely to be much of a struggle. Um, that's perfectly acceptable. It's okay. And it's fine to feel like I don't understand it. It requires you to have a deep in, uh, internalized ideas about modeling, data structures, and iteration. So don't worry if you don't get it first off. Uh, just put the chapter aside for a few more months, come back to it when your brain is a little bit more uh, acquainted with the uh, topics in this chapter, and uh, it'll start to make more sense. We're not going to discuss model building necessarily, even though it's uh, in the name of the chapter. Uh, we, we are going to push through to the end, but please be welcome to ask questions. This is a note to myself. Uh, the gap minder section of this chapter is fairly extensive. I'm going to hope to blaze through it within about five to 10 minutes, only showcasing the necessity of what this chapter's intent is doing. So obviously we talk about prerequisites. Uh, most of our chapters have this prerequisite table. Uh, we're going to be using the model R and the tidyverse uh, for the uh, functions inside. Okay. All right. Now, personally, near and dear to my heart, uh, I, I, my first entry into the R use was the Gapminder package, and uh, 
I actually took a, a real liking to um, the uh, Mr. Hans Rosling's uh, presentations, both TED Talks and also the uh, link to this BBC uh, video. I do really highly encourage uh, any user, especially when it comes to visualizing data. Um, Mr. Rosling does an amazing job. Um, unfortunately, he has since passed away. And so I did want to put his um, uh, birth and uh, death dates in here, um, just so you know that unfortunately, all the media that we have is only what's currently available. I do highly encourage you watching the video though. Furthermore, uh, we can thank Jenny Bryant for authoring the GapMinder package. It looks like I got a typo there. Uh, for authoring the GapMinder package, which makes it simple and easy to draw into um, R. So we're going to uh, evoke the li library GapMinder and then just visualize it. Okay. Uh, that code didn't work. I bet you I didn't do an eval on that one. Uh, to gain some insight into the data, we asked the question, how does life expectancy or life EXP change over time for each country? Well, initially, all we're doing is just plotting out uh, the trends of all of the data. We're using the both year and life expectancy, and then we're grouping it by country. When we look at the data, you can see that there's an upward trend. And this implies that the uh, further we go in our human society, the longer life expectancy we have. There are, however, some outliers that uh, really get a little bit uh, funny here. And so the chapter is trying to highlight why you or how you can start to draw out uh, these finer details uh, or, or minor nuances in your data set. At first glance, it appears uh, life expectancy is increasing, but not for all countries. To make it easier to view, we fit a model with a linear trend. The model captures steady growth over time and the residuals will show what's left. So in this case, uh, we're doing New Zealand uh, for a data frame of NZ, filtering the GapMinder package for country New Zealand, uh, and then we're piping that over to ggplot and then plotting out our lines. Now, what we'll see here is just, this is a trend line. Right. So using the previous graphical object and then comparing it here, all we're doing is just kind of shrinking it down uh, so it makes it a little easier to define. If we were to create a linear model with this, uh, with life expectancy being the dependent and year being the independent, and then again plotting it by that predicted value, we see that it's a linear path. Now, we also want to see the residuals of that. Right, and that... one quick question. So yeah, between the, the first two plots, that should be the same thing. The linear model is your trend line. This first line uh, is just plotting the data. So uh, the life expectancy or the uh, uh, yeah life EXP uh, plotted with our X coordinates of year. So all we're okay. doing is just and drawing then... a line. Mm -hmm. The next the code- second plot was? The second plot is we're using life expectancy as our dependent and our year as being the independent. So what we're doing is just plotting out the relationship between uh, the year and life expectancy as it increases. Uh, you, you're gonna live longer as we move further into the future, better medical facilities, uh, uh, what's the uh, vaccinations, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if we were to compare uh, a life expectancy of approximately 65 years old, at 19, uh, 1950, uh, by the year 2000 or beyond, uh, we're getting up to 77 plus years old. Um, what is the, it's not geriatric, what's the term where people live longer? Um, like you start to get into the, to the, the centennials, uh, people are living 100 plus years old uh, and beyond. We're seeing more frequency. The term for the age group? So well, that, that trend, no, the trend of, of oh. people just living longer. There's a, there's a uh, study about that or a term for that. I don't know. Sorry. No, okay. If, 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 if anybody watching the video is aware of it uh, in the future, um, go ahead and post about it because it, there is, it's not centennials. Yeah, anyway, the, the, the path here though is, is Sandra is just showing in the relationship, linear relationship uh, of uh, yeah, that, I think that for me, I just need to figure out then you know exactly what this is plotting versus the geom smooth in the in the previous one. So. Uh, good. Well, yeah. uh, we'll yeah. see that here in just a second. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, Frederica, go ahead. Um, that that's the the prediction. Mm -hmm. 
so that that's the the value of the prediction when you make a model you then fit the model and then when uh, add the prediction to your data yeah. and so you have a column with the estimated values and then you can plot it with the observed values and the predicted ones so here in the y axis you have the predicted values yeah, 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 yeah. I, I did notice that, but then I was just trying to see like exactly what that was. Thank you. Yeah, that helps. Because on the other one, you have life expectancy. Yeah, right. and then the actual, yeah. you know, yeah. like the okay. data. Um, and yeah. just I'm like, one okay. more. Well, that's why one is totally linear and the other one still has your, got it. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah, one is prediction and one is real. Yeah. The, the third point to this uh, particular example is is plotting the residuals as well. And this one I'm, I'm going to be careful on. Uh, I don't want to misspeak or, or uh, misconvey the importance of what's going on here. Uh, it does have a relationship later in this particular section uh, where we start pulling out countries, different countries uh, relationship uh, with these residuals. Looks like I do have a formatting error. It wrapped this. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is good, but how do we do this for every country? And so the question that the author is posing is, well, there's 142 countries in this uh, Gapminder package. How do we group them together and then do this same trend across all countries? Uh, maybe there's more than that. The, Sorry, I, I also just realized I was being dumb. It's filtered by New Zealand. Okay, I, I get yes, it. Yes, there you go. Yeah, it's only <laughs> yeah. one country at the moment. Right, <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So now what is going to happen is we start to nest the data. And so this is more of a wrangling process or a munging process where we're regrouping our content together to make life easier for us and ensure we're not copying and pasting forever, meaning just long, long blocks of script. Uh, we can use the map function, which would iterate over all of this. And the map feature is or map function is part of the per package. Uh, we've already talked extensively about per. Here you're going to, to receive a nested data frame. The key is the fact that it's nested. Now, I just wanna make a quick reference if you don't mind the extra minute. Uh, if you are to call on an API from some server, in most cases, you're gonna receive back JSON data. JSON is normally a nested format. So the idea or the concepts that you're working with in this particular chapter 25, as it relates to the future of what we're going to be doing, or in other books worth of chapters, they talk heavily about uh, nested JSON data and then how to wrangle that unnested, ungroup it, et cetera. Okay. So a lot of the concepts that are in this chapter also will help or support your future um, data access points. In this next point, we're, we're creating another data frame called by country using the Gapminder package, piping it as a grouped by function. We're using the country as the grouping and the continent included. So therefore we get this nested data frame or we're calling the nest function, which creates by country data frame. So here we're going to see all of the various countries listed and the continents that they are included in. Now, there's a reference in the text as you're reading this chapter where it says that uh, this is just an add-on. Uh, they're being a little bit more eloquent or elegant with their uh, coding base. Um, if you were to just do this without that country code, uh, I believe you, you wouldn't get the continent itself. You would just get a list of countries and then all the countries listed within. Uh, this creates a data frame that has one row per group or per country and in an un, a rather unusual column, uh, it's called dot data. Uh, it's a list of data frames or tibbles to be precise. And then there's a note here, don't use a structure function or STR to view this content because it's going to garbage out a very difficult means of viewing. Um, if you would like me to show you what that looks like, it's just kind of a really big block, but then there's a bunch of extra uh, concatenated data inside each one of the, data, uh, each one of the cells because again, it's that nested form. So we have one, uh, one cell that, that occupies the country and then all of the attributes in the second cell, you, because it's nested, it's kind of like grouped together. Okay. And that's why you don't wanna use the, the structure call uh, to view your data frame. We've seen this before in the past. If you just wanna get a quick touch point of what your data looks like, um, they're recommending don't do that here. Instead, what they're going to do is just use the 
uh, grouping feature. And John, I can't remember the uh, term of that hugging factor, the double double square uh, brackets. Subsetting. Subsetting. Thank you, sir. And that was the one that I could not come up with a really good word for of how to read it. So um, I, I don't know if like, hugging is the right word to use um, in my in my vocabulary. I'm saying that you're, <laughs> you're kind of grouping everybody together yeah. and you're, you're yeah. giving a group hug. Uh, like choose or, or that kind of concept is what I try to think of that as that you're yeah. with those you're choosing number one or you're choosing number two um, or you're slicing or you're however, uh, whatever, but it's subsetting is the formal uh, term for what you are doing there. <laughs> so we're, we're, we're getting each year uh, and then the life expectancy of that particular year and then the, the population for that group and then the GDP per capita. Sorry, can I ask one more question, Ryan? Yes. So go ahead. Go scroll up a little bit more. Yep. No worries. Um, okay. So here by country, you're we're getting the column data, and because those are tables, then you're using this subsetting double bracket to get the first element of all uh, out of all of those tables, right? That's correct. That's okay. correct. Thank you. Yeah, that's uh, that's a really good comment, Sandra. So yes, uh, in in by just viewing. Uh, by just viewing by country, the extra data column is all of those extra concatenated data. Mm -hmm. When, again, I'm, I'm making a, a reference to an unknown point uh, in, in space that when I was referencing nested JSON data, if you were to view that uh, pulling down from an API uh, uh, from a server and you get this, this JSON blob, we'll call it. Um, everything has these nested unique variables. And if you were to view it in a textual media, it would make more sense when I'm referring to this nesting feature, everything has a name uh, and then the, the, uh, the contents of that, that uh, placeholder. Because it's in this nested form, um, you don't wanna use the structure package. So yes, to your, your comment uh, by subsetting and just pulling out that first row and then seeing the contents, we see that there's uh, 12, um, 12 rows. Uh, I don't think that's the right term to use. Uh, it's the media rows inside works. that tibble. Yeah. yeah, there are 12, it's a 12 row tibble that is inside of that one cell. Yeah. And then each and of the cells has its own 12 row tibble. Yeah. Um, because each country has 12 years in the data. I think each one has 12 years. They might not all have all of the years um, calculated. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Was there a way to also um, for it to list you the country name? So for that first element? Um, I think he's, we'll get to that later where okay. you're okay. kind of, you're unnesting and doing things like that. So. Got it. Never mind. Yeah. yeah. Let's <laughs> continue. Yeah. Well, ultimately, uh, as we go through these particular steps in this first section of the chapter, uh, again, it's, it's kind of a speed bump to get through. They're, they're giving you this uh, idea of how to actually do all of these features and why it's important to follow all of these steps, then the last half of the chapter is breaking out and showing you the importance of each one of these uh, nuances. The next section is the list columns feature. So now we can start to add models to it. We create a country model with function data frame uh, uh, with a linear model, uh, life expectancy again as our dependent, year as our independent, and then passing that data frame back in. Now, uh, by viewing it, we're going to iterate through using the map feature by country and then data, uh, and then uh, applying that country model. Uh, uh, what am I saying here? We're putting the function. data back into the data, the data frame, correct? Uh, well, not, we're not yet at that point. So you're showing that, you know, you can create a, all the models by calling that country model function over and over with map. And then I'll let you continue. <laughs> okay. Uh, it may be too uh, costly. So instead, let's modify, uh, be a little bit more elegant with our data. Uh, storing related objects and columns as a part of the uh, value of data frames. So the second uh, point here, uh, by country, and then uh, adding that back into the data frame, piping it to mutate uh, with the model map data and the country model. So now if we were to view the by country, we can see that it's creating another uh, another column of data in this model list. Okay. 
This is a huge advantage. Uh, all related objects are stored together. You don't need to manually keep in sync with your filter or arrange. This is critical. So because we are now splitting all of this apart or doing a bunch of manipulation across this entire data frame and then keeping it stored in the same object, now you can start to manipulate and only deal with the data that's in that single data frame. Um, I made a statement uh, weeks and weeks and weeks ago, one of the presentations that were, divide, uh, that were delivered. And I said that I'm, I'm currently working with this really ugly format of media that is being included. Uh, and it's really difficult to kind of manipulate. And I was doing a very naive uh, approach where I was creating a whole bunch of data frames of just one specific point. Um, and then I had to remember what I was calling on to make sure that I was manipulating it properly. Here, I found this advantageous because it's all in the same naming convention or the same uh, uh, memory space. You can manipulate it inside that single memory space. Sorry, yes, I'm, I'm very excited to see this. This is yeah, fantastic. It yes. is. I love it there with the, the tibbles and then all of the LM models listed. Correct, very cool. correct. Uh, so that uh, I already said that about the huge advantage. Um, so now we want to filter uh, to Sandra's question earlier about can I filter by country? And the answer is yes. So now we can evoke the filter uh, uh, function, uh, passing it in continent equals Europe as a string. And then it's going <clears> to, <throat> it will list out all countries that match that uh, argument uh, of, of continent Europe. Does that answer your question, Sandra? I don't think that's quite what she no. was looking at, but I'm sorry. Um, one thing that I do say or do want to point out is like, yes, the tibbles with the actual data are like condensed down to where you can't see them. But a lot of times when you're at this point, you don't really care what the exact data is per country. Like, you know, at some point later, we're going to get to the point where, you know, maybe you're making a prediction out of the models or something that's what you would actually care about seeing all the underlying data you know you can dig in and look at it a piece at a time figure out what you know do some exploration but once you're at the point where you're like making a bunch of models for all the different countries or all, yeah all the different countries you probably don't like it's it's too much you can't care about it you can't absorb that much data to actually look at it and think about it and do anything so by just condensing it down as you know and then there's a column that has data and it's kind of like abstracting it away for you that, okay, this one cell is all the data for that country and whatever. Like there's some numbers in there that mean something. We use that to make a model. And then, you know, I could, um, I think in a minute, we're going to have some broom um, stuff where we add other columns that are like predictions and output and how good is our model might be all we really care about per country because then you can sort uh, on say accuracy and find the countries where the model sucks and that's probably really meaningful of um something is weird about these countries let's look at those that kind of thing Jonas, you don't mind yeah. me asking this particular question so i was as i'm as i'm reading over this and, and and creating the presentation one of the questions i kept asking in the back of my mind was what about like the join, uh, like the like the mutate package, uh, uh, dplyr uh, package, where you're you're splitting and and merging back together and doing some you know uh, cell manipulation? That's not exactly what's going on here because we're we're create uh, we're treating it as this homogeneous unit and manipulating inside there, correct? Right. So if you wanted to mutate like inside of the data in a column is that kind of what you're asking i that, think so like yeah splitting it and then bringing it back together yeah yes. um so i don't remember i don't think we get through a ton of usage of tidy r um in here but that is where you can start I see. pulling those columns back out into their own rows basically okay. then you would do some mutating and actually yeah we do some unlist or not unlist but unnest coming up Perfect. um yeah. so you can unnest do some manipulation renest you know, it's just a way to um, kind of go back and forth at well, the I, level of abstraction. I answered my own, well, <laughs> as I'm, again, as I asked that question to myself and I'm, I'm reading this content, I'm realizing that you don't need to go down that path because it's not a requirement. There's a, there's a better, there's a better uh, method 
uh, we're learning about this better method of, of being able to do just that. Yeah. So, all right. Um, so the next one is just arranging. So here we're going to alphabetize, uh, arrange all of our data by the con uh, continent and country. Uh, so again, it, Africa starts out with the A alphabet. And so it's, it's listed first visit, uh, visually. Now, there's a statement here that I, I wanted to bold and highlight and, and make very, very apparent. It says, if you list data frames and lists of models were separate objects, meaning that you're dealing with these in two different memory spaces. And again, I'm using that term to try and separate the concepts of what we're conveying. You've got two different objects to manipulate with. Uh, you also have to remember that whenever you reorder or subset one vector, you need to also reorder and subset the other vector. There is nothing that will error on you in this case. So therefore, if you forget to do this, I'm saying if you if you go down this path that you don't want to go, uh, you don't want to use, if you were to go down that path and you don't reorder or subset every single time, then your data is going to get all mangled together and uh, there's no error that will, will tell you the information you're producing is inaccurate. You're going to get the wrong answer. So I found this statement very, very important. And again, it just highlights the reasoning of going through this uh, particular task versus a earlier uh, that join and separate and all the other uh, mutate content uh, previously. So in the first section, we nested everything, and now we're going to unnest it. So Sorry, previously- Brian, can I just ask a question about that statement? Yeah, okay, go ahead. So um, with all of this, uh, you know, like a, whatever they're called, list, nested lists or list columns, um, mm -hmm. since we're using the map package to sort of, you know, make this all, all pretty, is, is it any different really than if you had like you're saying, you know, two vectors or two different data frames, one with the models, one with the countries, and they have a, a like key in common that you can do a join. I'm what I'm implying to that comment, Sandra would say that you don't even need to worry about it if you're following in this chapter 25 version of nesting and unnesting, because everything is intrinsically locked together. You won't need to worry about any sort of a but, unique key. Oh, sorry, John, go ahead. I was just going to say, but conceptually, it's yeah, same, right? it, it would be yeah, the same okay. as having a, a shared key column. Yes, yes. Um, but it, it makes it easier that you don't have to yes. think about yes. joining them together. Yes. There are cases that I have for sure where I might work like this for a while, but then, oh, having all those models in that same data frame makes a massive, crazy data frame. So I'll pull a little piece of it out mm -hmm. that... Um, maybe is just some of the summary data or whatever and keep the models themselves in a separate data frame so I could save that off to disk and like ignore it, get it out of RAM, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. Um, because okay. a data frame of models can be enormous, you know, depending mm -hmm. on what you're doing. Um, mm -hmm. But it's like, I don't know, it's so handy and it's about to get handier, I think, as we get the res residuals in there, so. Right, cool. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. So now with the unnesting piece, uh, we use the uh, by country pass it to mutate residuals of, of the uh, uh, per map to uh, function um, with data model and then add residuals and then uh, print out by country again. We see that at the far end, we now have all of our, uh, we have our list of model that was the previous uh, code example, but now we've also added the residuals of that uh, nested data frame. Uh, we, we uh, used the map feature per package uh, to iterate through every one of them, producing this, uh, uh, making this calculation on every single uh, element uh, or, or every single object within the data frame. So I asked this rhetorical question. Uh, by now, you should ask yourself, uh, how can I plot all of my data frames that I'm creating, or, or a bunch of data frames? Because in essence, what we've got here is a nested data frame of data frames because the data frame is an object of, of storage. Now I'm just nesting this all together. How do I, how do I be able to map all of this and you can't, or a plot, uh, uh, visualize all of this? And the answer is you can't. There probably are ways to do it, but it would not be very optimal. So we have to unnest everything. 
So we're going to uh, create another object res uh, residuals uh, using the unnest command, uh, passing it by country and then sorting by or uh, I always mess this sentence up. I'm sorry that I'm pausing for a second. Uh, I can't ever remember the, the arguments, the variables that we're calling on here. We're passing it the by country data frame. The second one is putting it back in to residuals. Is that correct? It's choosing which column to unnest. There we go. So resids is your, your nested column that you want to unnest. You don't want to unnest the model column. You don't want to unnest the data column in this case, because that would make, or that could be messy, basically. And so we're leaving those ones nested inside. Um, gotcha. Yep. I apologize for for pausing and, and stumbling over that. I always mess up the <laughs> actual sentence of arguments without having the variable names uh, contained within. So now we're printing our residuals, and here we can see with the unnested uh, value that that John had just mentioned, um, all of the data contained within that that uh, previously nested form. Okay. And now we can plot all of them, or the ones that we select. So with the residuals uh, data frame, piping it to ggplot uh, using the aesthetics of year for uh, for X and residuals for Y? Yep. Yes. Uh, and then with the geome line, uh, grouping it by country, uh, the alpha of one third. There's a, there's a comment about the alpha and uh, Frederica, if you wanna jump in and correct me on that statement, the alpha is, is the weight of the line, correct? No. No. It's the opposite of transparency, okay. basically. So it's how solid is the line. If your alpha is- That's it. Point one, it's a very light line. It's a very see-through line. If the alpha is one, you know, by default your alpha is one, that means it's a completely uh, non-transparent line. It, it's completely solid. Um, Changing your alpha would make it a really messy graph then, correct? So the lower, what you do, the reason he's doing a lowered alpha is that way when lines are on top of each other, it makes it dark versus if a line's up separate, it's, it's a lighter gray because it's see-through. So it's, it's got like one third, um, again, it's like it would be two thirds transparent. So one third apparent, <laughs> one third solid. Um, and so it's just, that is a very common thing. Like if you've got, if you're doing a point, a, a geom point and you've got tons of data that's gonna be on top of each other, you can do things like jitter to get it off of each other, but you can also just lower the alpha and that way if there is a spot where a bunch of points are laid on top of each other, it gets darker. Um, that can be a really helpful way to find, to just kind of look at a bunch of data and see a pattern if you lower that alpha. And I'm sure there's tons more about that kind of thing over in the ggplot2 book. There is. <laughs> oh, I, I, yeah. Again, it's that it's that concept of arguments. I, I apologize yeah. for always stumbling over some of the necessities no of what these these mean. <laughs> The graph that we produce with the geom smooth line on top is now giving us that trend uh, of that uh, plotted residuals. Okay. And now um, each country, uh, uh, now the next thing that we can do is create a facet of all of the various countries. So again, using that same residuals data frame, passing it to ggplot um, and uh, giving a, a facet wrap of continent, we have our separation of all of the uh, all of the calculations we've made for each one of our nested uh, countries, okay. and the highlight point that the they make in this uh, uh, section of the document is Africa is having a really funny uh, residual point here. Uh, there's a, it's not fitting the model very well, and so they we want to go look at that one point. So going all the way back to the very beginning of one of the, the learning objectives of this section was you've got your data frame. We're going to do some manipulation of nesting and unnesting uh, uh, with creating some calculations. Now that you have it in this form, now you can start to pick out very, very unique details about uh, uh, one, uh, one grouping of your data frame. That makes sense. And I, I had Sandra in mind, uh, Sandra, with your profession of, of uh, the... Uh, bioinformatics kind of concept of uh, DNA strings, et cetera, uh, or even, even uh, I don't want to get into your profession, but being able to group things together, this might visualize some trends in, in activity or, or uh, uh, 
creates more hypotheses that you can you can work with. Yeah, I like. Yeah, oh, go ahead. Sure. Um, well, no, I'm just saying. You know, a lot of the stuff I do, um, it's either not this complicated, or there are dedicated packages that are bioinformatics specifically, like that will run you, you know, thousands of GLM models for, like, for example, differential gene expression, and you just gotta input your data set into that in a sense, and what, and, and not how to manipulate it, but pretty much the the packages will do it for you. I I do really like. <laughs> In, I don't know if I locked up or in these. Sorry. I think you're locking up or, or lagging out, Sandra. Or I am. Um I think it's No, I think Sandra's locking up. Okay. Um well so uh, yeah, I think it's we lost me. her. Yeah. Oh yep. Sorry. You're yeah, you're frozen on screen. Um I just, I really like the, um, you know, that this is a different type of modeling than what you're going to go into in like the tidy modeling with our book. This is not aimed at being predictive. It's aimed at understanding your data. And so, you know, we did all these linear models and yeah, they're not great models, but they're good enough that we can see something happened in Africa in the 90s in at least one country in Africa in the 90s. And we can dig in and see what that's about. We can you know, dig in and see uh, um, like, what is this one Asian country that had a problem uh, in the late 70s? Uh, I could have, well, it wouldn't just be in the late 70s if it were the one I would guess, but um, whatever. It gives you like a means to just quickly explore and then dig in and see what is interesting in this data. What is, you know, depending on what types of questions you're trying to answer or whatever, it, it's just a way to um, to to find things that aren't easy, <laughs> and then dig into those more. And then maybe you would use a different type of model for that country because, it, or or more likely, what you want to do is factor in some other. You know what el what else was different? What else do you need to take into account? Um, such as major events, wars, and um, famines, and you know anything like that. So. Mm -hmm. Um, it adds some classification to why the trends are, are witnessed uh, or, or as, as viewed, you're, you're, you're almost kind of, I don't know, uh, creating the storyline that goes along with the data that you're representing. Right. Yep. It says, we can note that uh, we still have a very large, uh, sorry, have very large residuals, namely in Africa, suggesting our model isn't fitting very well. So now we talk about the model quality. And John had mentioned that we have the broom package. So in this case, we're going to use broom glance. Uh, instead of looking at the residuals from the model point, we could look at some general measurements of the model quality. So in example, we create this broom glance and then we pass it in the NZ mod. And I wanted to go back up to the very top because I couldn't remember where MZ mod as a data frame was created. But um, this is the New Zealand, uh, New Zealand. And what you have inside that nested frame is the data contained. So we have the R squared, the adjusted R squared, sigma statistics, p-value on and on and on. Okay. And you can mutate and unnest to create more data frames with row for each country. So here we're passing it by country, mutating, uh, using that broom glance feature, um, and then the iteration, right, the, the per package of map uh, with the model and the glance, and then we unnest and view the glance output. So now it's you, you've got your your previously nested content of each country and and its attribute of continent and then all of the data that goes along with. So by using that broom glance, now we're passing in or sorry, you can slide over and see the rest of all the data that's populated uh, in this uh, uh, textual view. And that, that's actually a comment that they had in this uh, point was make sure that you're seeing all the other data. So, because it's kind of in this viewable range, there's a, a lot more going on to the right of your, of your viewable screen. Okay. This isn't quite the output that we want uh, because it still includes all the list columns. Uh, indicating that things are still grouped together. Um, this is a default behavior. Uh, when we unnest, uh, we work on single data uh, for data rows to express these columns. We can use the dot drop true, but pause, hold on. 
the dot uh, dot drop true has been deprecated from this package. Um, John, I was going to give you a moment to expand on that. Yeah, well, just uh, yeah, that was one that I made sure to point out to Ryan as I was yes. reading this of, um, you know, this book is due for an updated version. And this is one of the things where they just decided this didn't fit in the um, this function like there are other things other ways to select columns and unselect columns so they just dropped this drop argument from the the function so if you actually want to do this you instead of saying drop dot drop equals true use select minus um data minus model you know whatever you explicitly want to get rid of instead of just randomly because it's too um it's too easy to, to accidentally drop a column this way. And that's why they took it out, I'm pretty sure, is they try to get rid of things where you can too easily make a mistake. Um, they talk about that in, in the um, Tidy Models book, uh, Tidy Modeling with R, that the design principle they use is, um, what do they call it? The pit of success, that they want you to accidentally succeed as much as possible, not accidentally fail. And so anything like drop, yeah, that's that's a, a argument that leads to accidental failure. So they take that out, but they have other arguments that lead to accidentally doing the right thing. They leave those in. And John, if I could expand on this, the thought process. So understanding the, the pit of success um, with, with guiding a user to being more successful than, than failing, is this dot drop deprecation or sorry uh the dot drop feature now deprecated would it be in a similar context by dropping a column of data it strips it from its memory right it's would be a similar concept of like drop table in in sql where you literally can shred your database is that yeah a similar concept? Um, like yeah you could be running through some multi-step process and then you use that dot drop equals true and oops you don't have your model anymore and they want you to explicitly say Oh, I want to get rid of my model. Not, uh, oops, you know, you you maybe you spent hours producing these models and then you accidentally drop them. That would be very annoying. Um, and so they want you to explicitly select minus model, like get rid of that column explicitly, not accidentally, because you know maybe you're like, oh yeah, I don't need the residuals column anymore. So uh, I'll say dot drop equals true and get rid of the residuals column. Oh wait, no it actually got rid of my data and it got rid of my model. Um, so I I totally like agree with the design change there. That is a very dangerous argument to just put between, behind a single Boolean. Um, yeah, uh, to your benefit, John, with that comment, I did not see the second half of that same statement. So as we go down further into this chapter, there's there's a section where I, I literally said I don't, know exactly if I'm implying <laughs> it properly. So if you see that grouping of text, let me know and I'll, I'll pause and, and okay. expand on there. So uh, with that deprecated feature and John's explanation of the select minus, uh, we are now, uh, it, is, it is literally chopping off some of the-, the Well, what, data it, frame, right? what it would have done is it would have gotten rid of the data model and resids columns and it just doesn't do anything anymore because they got rid of the dot drop argument um again you know at this point depending on what you're doing you probably can get rid of those columns because the way we're looking at this we don't really care exactly what the data is we don't care what what the model is we just want to know oh for um afghanistan the model works pretty well in this case but um you know, for Angola, it doesn't work quite as well looking at the R squared values that they have uh, that they're outputting, for example. Um, and so you might just want to sort by, um, yeah, actually, you might want to just scroll down a tiny bit. And <laughs> Give it'll answer the question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so um, we can yeah. look for countries that don't fit our model well. And so this is where we're arranging. Uh, we're, we're creating an arrange function, uh, passing it the R squared. And then all it's doing is sorting by the uh, least to greatest. And so we can see that uh, most of our African countries uh, in this continent list, uh, we can see that the African countries are the ones that are, are uh, having the most difficulty fitting the model or, or, or 
we're, we're not representing it properly. The model's not representing it properly. The worst fitting models seem to be Africa. Uh, we can add a geom jitter. Uh, again, that's kind of just uh, separating your data. It makes it more apparent of what's going on. So here we're, we're uh, focusing on the uh, uh, R squared uh, as the uh, point and looking at the output. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not, I kind of missed or glazed over this, this object. If there's any highlight that anybody wants to add in here. The main thing is just looking at um, like each kind of column on this is a continent. I see. And then how bad are the models in that continent? You know, some of them work on every continent, but uh, the Americas tend to be all fairly good. Um, Europe, Europe's almost all fairly good. Oceania only has a couple countries, so it's um, it's good, it's fine. Um, but yeah, so that would be okay. Um, you know, we started with the looking just glance or our initial look at the data. It seemed like in general. Um, as time goes on, life expenses expectancy gets longer. What we're seeing is these countries don't have that simple re relationship. Like whatever the countries are that have low scores, isn't just a simple line. See. So there's something more going on in those countries. And again, depending on what kind of country, uh, questions you're trying to answer, then you might want to dig more into those um, particular pieces. You know, those particular um, countries just examine their data in more detail or whatever you're doing it, it depends what you're doing but uh, like if we were trying to say um in general uh life expectancy it, life expectancy gets longer uh linearly with time in order to be able to say that we want to be able to say well except you know and here's the cases where it doesn't and it's you know where there's been more um exploit exploitation for natural resources perhaps or um, you might dig in for different reasons or different um, ways to to look at this. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> the the answer to the question at the bottom here uh, after we graph this uh, uh, residual plot, and again, it's this green line is is uh, sorry. These are the countries of Africa. They're showing the this kind of natural trend at this 1990s area. Uh, late 80s, early 90s as just dropping off. And the comment uh, in response to that trend was the HIV AIDS uh, epidemic and also uh, genocide as well. Uh, a couple of the countries experienced some uh, war, uh, uh, genocide. So. Yeah, we're, we're adding reasons for why the trends are, are happening, adding a storyline to the trends. All right, that's ending the Gapminder chunk. Again, that was a speed bump that uh, I promised was gonna be 10 minutes and, and was <laughs> way longer. Uh, I will do my best to uh, finish this chapter, so. Uh, I mean, we've got, we got like five minutes left. Okay. <laughs> so, um, uh, I, I'm, I don't know, I, like I'm, I'm sure you've got a lot more to go through. So I think let's just go ahead and continue it next week. Okay. So. Um, and you know maybe uh, you know you'll have some time to look at it and see if you want to cover all of it next week or how you want to break it up because I don't want it to take a week per section. No. <laughs> but uh, that was a good. So that one, I th if I remember right, what we basically did it is um, that one kind of goes through all the concepts of how list columns work and different ways you can use them. And then what we have left is kind of really diving in with how do they work, how can you manipulate them. Um, what are other ways you might use them, that kind of thing, which it, it is interesting because now we, I think from here on out, we kind of totally dropped the whole model um, thing. And we're just looking at how do list columns work, which is like I said, what this chapter is really about. Um, Get some concepts yeah. too, or, or the ideas of why this is, uh, sorry, so important. I, I, again, I go back to the beginning. I do recommend uh, every, uh, I can't, I can't demand anybody do anything, but I would highly recommend looking at uh, Hans uh, Rosling's uh, data. So if, if we talk about some very big um, names within statistical, uh, uh, the, the uh, discipline of, of statistics, um, 
the 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 manner or the presentation, uh, the means in which the uh, Mr. Hosling or Rosling was uh, manipulating this, it's amazing to watch the mm -hmm. videos. And yeah. he's he's very uh, what's that word when you're uh, uh, really intrigued by a person? Uh, they they're, they're uh, personable. Yeah, it's it, yeah. like he draws you in yeah. to the story that he's providing. Uh, he's got some TED Talks, the BBC link that uh, is in this uh, book and uh, is a good one. It's a short five minute video. But um, what's crazy, and, and I just I'll close with this. There's some extra media that was generated during the COVID pandemic. People were using different packages to represent data or, or present data. One of them is this three dimensional space, kind of like a hologram sort of concept that's actually what this video is doing but it's it's fairly dated uh, and so that was kind of neat to to witness it um, there's a story that goes along with even how the bbc set up that uh, uh, infrastructure to produce that video uh, that's a really good one to watch as well and i'm sorry i'm probably being uh, a little too intrigued with with just how they presented it but um, it helps comprehend this chapter and, and the media that we're we're uh, manipulating here so That was all. Can I ask a, a random question? Can you go back one slide, Ryan? Very last, oh. um, almost almost to the very last okay. plot where you had the, the points plotted by continent. There that one, yeah. Um, to label those points by country within continent, could you just use a geom point and then label? I mean, I don't know what the syntax would be. So there are um, a couple of ways to do that. There's geom text and geom label. And if oh, I remember okay. right, geom okay. label is just geom text with a background. Okay. Um, but then there's also, uh, there's a GG text package that um, makes all of that prettier because the built-in, if you think about it, what, what a geom text is gonna do is it's gonna put the country like exactly overlap overlapping with the point, yeah. it centers the, or either centers or it puts the left end. I think it puts the left end of the text at the point. And so anyway, there are packages that deal with labeling things the way you want them to actually be labeled. And if you think about it with this, you're gonna get a whole bunch of text labels on top of one another. So you would yeah. almost definitely wanna filter some of this out before you um, do that labeling, or it's just gonna be a mess mm -hmm. of text. Um, but yeah, geom text is where to start. And then okay. GG, GG text, um, the package GG text is uh, probably where you would want to end up. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And I think, Frederica, if I'm not mistaken, I believe the uh, couple of citations that you had posted, and I think I included one, I think it's chapter 15 of the GG plot book, uh, talks about labels, uh, Sandra, that uh, it, it, it would probably... Uh, benefit to review that section because I think the package GG text and some other references are there mm -hmm. as uh, as additional reading. GG repel yeah. actually is the yeah. that's the labeling one that I was thinking of. GG text is really nice for formatted text like making really pretty labels and GG mm -hmm. repel makes text labels that don't um, stack on like they uh, they dodge one another mm -hmm. and so it's mm -hmm. and it'll like push it off and then put a line back to whatever point it's looking pointing at that kind of thing. Um, it's really helpful. Okay. I've, I've used that one before um, for genius, but I definitely need to review like how to <laughs> you know get some of these intricacies down. So thank you. One thing to keep in mind, just totally off topic, but if you use GG Repel, um, there ha there's an argument uh, in it that is seed. If you don't supply that argument, it will it totally randomly places the labels. And then if you call it again, it will re-randomize and place the labels in a different way. So if you want to make it repeat or reproducible, you'll want to use that seed argument. Um, Cause otherwise it's just, it, it is, it, you know, it's randomly trying to find a way for everything to fit. And so okay. it's not going to be the same. Um, and then, so what I usually will do if I'm trying to make something pretty is I'll supply that seed argument, try it, see if it looks nice. If it doesn't supply a different seed argument, just kind of play around until I find one that works. Um, but yeah, in order to ensure that you'll be able to reproduce it, you need to make sure you pass that argument in.
Great. That, that actually explains a lot <laughs> as to what I've been saying. <laughs> Thank you, Federica. What's his name or her name? Uh, she's Makia. Huh? Oh, oh, adorable. <laughs> <laughs> so cute. <laughs>